I mean, if I had been an architect and they'd asked me to design the World Bank, I would have asked them to build a tent on Pennsylvania Avenue, not, not, not this cathedral, uh, to alleviate poverty. It's sort of like an oxymoron. Um, my office used to be across the street for 10 years. I marveled at this, um, this architecture to erase poverty that was easily, at the time it was built, the best looking building in DC. <laughs> so what are some of the metaphors? Well, we talked today about rising inequality is the number one threat facing uh, democratic expression. Uh, stubborn uh, inequalities in this country, in America, we, have, we rank lower on the OECD um, mobility list than Zimbabwe. Um, we uh, are reaching the, the fabled 1% versus 90%. That's no longer true. It's 0.001% um, to everybody else. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And uh, everybody, uh, I teach at Harvard Business School um, with on the uh, Reimagining Capitalism course. I've been doing that for six years. And I'm a person who would never have applied to Harvard Business School and certainly never would have been accepted. Um, and uh, the first time I went there, I was dressed like this, probably a little bit worse. And um, it, for me, it was like, um, it was like the, uh, West Point of corp corporate America. Um, and I had to face three classes of 240 students each at the bottom of the amphitheater. And they were all um, they were all above me and they had all these great gizmos where they could vote on whether they liked what I was saying, whether I was relevant, whether I was authentic. Um, and <laughs> it, was, it was a humbling experience. Um, but at the end of the day, at the end of each class, and I did three a day, um, they three take, day. yeah, three a day, and you know, they have to carry you back to Logan. <laughs> <laughs> I volunteer. <laughs> Besides, the professor, Rebecca Henderson, is a guiding light if you ever get a chance yeah. to meet her. Um, they carried me out to the Logan Airport on a stretcher. Um, <laughs> but they, they voted, and it was, um, the question was, so after you graduate, you know, um, what will you do? Will you, uh, you go with Michael into the trenches? Will you, you know, pay off your student loans, put some money in the account, and then go to Michael? Will you, you know, elicit a giant yawn and say, interesting, thanks, but no thanks? Or will you go to Goldman Sachs? That was basically. And so, over the years, the percentages have grown in my direction. Now, uh, we're about 15 to 17% of the class says we'll go with Michael right after graduation. Another 25% says, let me pay off the student loans and then we'll go with Michael. 40% says, boring, and the rest go to Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. And I, and what they don't know is that I would have gone up there if just one of them said, we'll go with Michael. And uh, we've had these students do projects with us in the hinterlands around where Trump Ground Zero is. I would say the Cincinnati metropolitan region is Trump Ground Zero. Um, uh, and uh, it's incredible. Uh, we have um, totally turned around economies, lives, um, created ownership in the meanest places, diversified on all levels. So I really want to talk about that. I want to talk about why, why it is that the divine left does not want workers to become owners. We all know why the unreconstructed right doesn't want workers to become owners. They, they, they are, they're only happy when you're on their plantation. And when you get off the plantation, they become miserable and believe it's time for some sort of repressive tactics. And you see that in politics every day here in the United States. But there's a divine left that, as you're walking by, that stick that stiletto into your back because they also don't want workers to become owners. And why is that? because they are wedded and embedded in the class struggle. And if you take the class struggle away from them, they just don't know what to do. Mm. They have no vocabulary to replace or substitute the vocabulary of class struggle with the words and vocabulary of freedom, collaboration, solidarity. So we're trying to stop that because uh, we bounce against the right, we bounce against the left, and we find them equally heartless and unimaginative. In the business schools, really pioneered by Harvard, they talk about creative destruction. 
why is it that no one talks about creative reconstruction? I mean, if you could make a whole lifestyle out of creative destruction and launch companies based on this principle, what's the business model for creative reconstruction? Why do we not apply the same technology vigor um, and academic elan to uh, creative reconstruction? And as a result, you know, I worked on the Gephardt campaign in 1988. Um, the Gephardt campaign was, you know, against NAFTA. They told us, you guys are not free traders. We were free traders. We were just more fair traders than free traders. No one listened to the Gephardt campaign. We didn't make it out of the primary season. Although we had our best fundraising night in a place called Gallup Police, Ohio, which again is ground zero for the Trump voter. And you know, that was in 1988, and here we are in 2018, so do the math 40 years later. We reap the seeds of what we sow, we reap the crop of what we sowed, which is ignoring what was happening in terms of globalization, in terms of inequalities, and in terms of creative destruction without creative reconstruction. In other words, we did nothing for these populations. We let the tides of history wash over them. We yesed them on the Democratic side and the Republican side. We told them to man up. And uh, we left them behind. And when their voice of rage turned into a primal electoral scream, all of us were shocked in 2016. But why were we shocked? I remember um, a lot of my friends um, and I worked on the 92 Clinton campaign. Um, we also worked on both Obama campaigns. And I remember in this last Obama campaign, um, I begged the campaign for months that I wanted to do an inequality fundraiser. And they said, ah, come on, dude, what's an inequality fundraiser? Is there like an inequality caucus out there? And I said, yes, there is, as a matter of fact. It's called the 99%, there's a lot of people. Um, and they find it, and I said, I, and I wanted um, a Heather Bushi, who was the chief economist for the Clinton transition team, who written her PhD on um, inequality, so she knew something about it. And two weeks before the election, they said, okay, fine, you can go do your inequality fundraiser. So we held, held it in our office. Uh, we raised $80,000 in a week. Um, selling tickets of $200 a piece. Um, she came for two and a half hours, she talked and people asked, you could hear a pin drop. People still talk about that event because you just felt the floor levitate. People walked out of there with hope and consciousness. I walked out of there with total fear thinking, if this campaign waited, uh, and they were talking, wow, Michael, there is an inequality caucus. And they, you know, telling me that two weeks before the election, of course there's an inequality caucus. It's all over America. And the reason why we had so many people show up is because when we charged them $200 a piece, people could afford it. So if you give people a voice and a vote, they show up and they have something to say. And that's what ownership does. So, so what do we do? We help ownership, but we, it's not just ownership, like a law firm partnership or I built it all myself or even it takes a village, which are the two extremes of the American experience right now. You can't decide which way to go. Um, we uh, create metaphors. You know, the phrase sleeping with strange bedfellows now is a dangerous thing to say in public because everybody accuses you of having some ulterior agenda for saying that. But if you just look at the phrase in and of what it is, um, it is reaching across the aisles to communities that have nothing in common with you and finding something in common and working on it. So we've focused on unions and cooperatives. And why have we focused on unions and cooperatives? Because in most of the countries around the world, they are the solidarity bearer and they are the workplace democracy bearer. And they're in most of the developing countries. Um, and the big problem is no one knows how to get these forces together. Now, I know in this room that there are are learned people, history and law and other disciplines that I am woefully ignorant of and in, but I do know that in, in the 1800s, in the 1870s, Roche, the Rochdale uh, partners, the pioneers, Rochdale is this little village near Manchester and Birmingham, Northwest Manufacturing the UK. Uh, they, uh, unions and cooperatives were invented at the same time. They came together and they articulated the Rochdale principles, which became the six or seven cooperative principles that are now honored throughout the world. And um, Mondragon has 10 principles. I'll talk to you a little bit about Mondragon. And one of those 10 principles that the other cooperative principles don't have is the one that says that labor is sovereign 
and um, finance, while essential, is subordinate to labor. And it's a very important principle. Um, they got it from Abraham Lincoln. So what, it, what does this all mean? What this means is that um, uh, labor and uh, unions and cooperatives started around the same time, but then over history, over time, they separated for autarkic reasons, and each went their own way. But now, as we look to create a more living, human-oriented democracy, we can't do it unless we restitch Humpty Dumpty back together again. The phrase for Mondragon is humanity at work. Um, it's a wonderful phrase. Um, how many people in this room know something about Mondragon? No, Jerome does, I do. Um, Chris is not here anymore. She's like the US academic expert on it, um, Chris Clem. But So I, I will give you this brief overview, and I apologize to those who have heard this a billion times before. So if you look at Northwest Spain, uh, in the Basque region of Spain, about 2.2 million people. Uh, the word out on the Basques is that their heads are a little larger, their um, blood type is different. Of course, that's all BS. Um, but that's you know prejudice speaking, right? Every time you have a minority group, you first start with the prejudice part. Uh, but they were the armorers of Europe. The famous sword of Toledo was made by the Basques. Not in Toledo. Um, they were the ones who built the plowshares and the, and the, and the shields and the swords. And if, if it was bending metal, they, they're, they're, they have it in their DNA. But they always have been on the wrong side of recent history. So they opposed Franco during the Spanish Civil War. They paid a price. If you've seen Picasso's Guernica, you know what I'm talking about. And then, of course, um, yeah, and, and then, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a terrifying pain when you think about it. Um, and Guernica was picked because the Basque culture is 2,000 years old. It's an indigenous culture. I have a language that doesn't trace back to anything. Um, and, the, and there's a tree in Guernica where the Lendakati, which is the uh, Basque word for president, elected president, recites the principles of, of the Basque culture when he or she is elected. And um, of course, you know, uh, when they strafed um, the, the Guernica, they, they went after the tree. And, and, and then World War II. Um, so between the Spanish Civil War and World War II, the interior part of the Basque region, which is like West Virginia or Pennsylvania, um, it was rubble, uh, basic rubble. It was like Detroit after Detroit burned. 75% um, unemployment, cholera, famine, you name it. And uh, they sent a priest to uh, clean it all up, you guys, Catholics. The priest chickened out, left. They sent the, the substitute priest. This guy came on a bike, blind in one eye. His name was Jose Maria Riz Mendireta. And um, he started preaching collaboration. He said, if you don't collaborate, you'll never get yourself out of the hole that you're in. It took him 15 years. He even organized you know, football, soccer games, because sports sometimes are a metaphor for collaboration. But after 15 years, Four engineers graduated from his little school, and they formed a little cooperative, and they made kerosene stoves. The priest went down to Franco's Madrid, tried to get them Social Security. Of course, he was rejected, so he started his own mutual, tried to get a bank loan to expand, and was rejected, so he started his own bank. And if you fast forward 62 years, it's about 71,000 people, about $16 billion in sales, it's the 10th largest Spanish multinational. It's the fourth largest in terms of creation of employment. It's under 50, 150 countries. It works under the principle of one worker, one vote. The school is now a university, a cooperative university, owned and run by the students, the teachers, uh, the parents of the students, and the cooperatives that hire them. Uh, the mutual is called Lagonoro. It's about $8 billion. The bank's about $60 billion. Um, and um, it works. It works. And uh, the Financial Times uh, usually supports it. The Economist and the Wall Street Journal usually attack it, which is a sign of good health. Um, and um, it's a, a very interesting process. Every PhD student on cooperatives in the country has written a thesis. It gets 4,000 industrial tourists a year, whether they want them or not. 
Um, people, it's a working class town, it's no big deal. If you ever stayed at the Hotel Mondragon, that's a forgettable experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> people show up uh, and they want to see people, you know, doing bolts um, because they can't believe that there's a place in this world where everyone has the same vote, everybody has the same share, where there's eight salary differences between the lowest and the highest, and when things are going wrong, the whole entire team votes to lower its own salary so they can help out those who are in trouble. Um, this solidarity principle, people just can't believe that something like this exists and they can't believe that people fight hard to get there and stay there and they, and they can believe that everybody tries to raid these people for vertically uh, constructed corporations but they can't believe that nobody really goes. It is what it is. So my affiliation with Mondragon is they have four global delegates, one in Russia, uh, Russia, China, India, and I'm the U.S. one. I'm the first U.S. one, started in 1999, so that's 19 years, and I'm still an ongoing experiment. Uh, the big debate between me and Mondragon right now is that uh, Mondragon believes that you know they compete against the Germans in manufacturing, they compete against the Italians in design, and they believe their culture is something that evolved for their own, you know, historic. Um, reasons, indigenous reasons. It's not exportable. They, they're not proselytizers. They believe in, you know, look at my example, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you about it. I'll show you, but I won't tell you. We then, they don't go on, you know, chest beating missions. Um, they're uh, aesthetic, they're humble, and they're usually quiet as opposed to all the other noise you hear in the system about people overselling things that don't exist. Um, so, so, but in the middle of all this, uh, you know, there are menaces to the system. They've had to expand globally. So their international uh, people, which is the fastest growing part, are not members of the cooperative. They haven't figured that one out yet. Before, when they created their own bank, uh, they, they funded themselves that way. You know, right now, after 62 years, to when you're finally accepted within a cooperative, it costs you about 18,000 euros. Most people starting out don't have that, so you get a bank loan and you pay it out over time, the same as I did when I, I joined my first employee-owned company. Um, but the problem is that the bank now, after the 2008 Great Recession, the bank can also only put about 4% of its profits towards Mondragon, which means that where do we find capital? Where are the capital financing institutions that know how to lend to a phenomenon like this? We have $117 billion of social impact capital in the United States, but they still want 15%. They still want to own your company. Uh, um, and we have $44 billion of Taft-Hartley pension funds that are worker-friendly, but um, if they take a stake in you, they want to seat on the board. It's not going to work on the Mondragon system. So, you know, they have challenges. Also, um, uh, they are, you know, more women want to run factories, and so they are. But they're not at 50-50 yet, they're not at parity, but they're getting closer. Also, women engineers, my wife is an engineer, so I can speak from some experience here. W women engineers think differently than male engineers, and often in a much better way. They see things differently. Um, so you have to design courses for, that appeal to women. So they become engineers and they use their brilliance to design the things we need in the way that we need them. Um, so you have to change education. So Mondragon started with education. And from education, it went to this incredible ecosystem um, that uh, is self-healing. Uh, it moves capital and it moves people around. And I'll give you one example, which is an example of failure because we always learn the most from our failures. Um, in 2008, uh, we, our original cooperative, the one that made those kerosene stoves, um, later became a $2.2 billion uh, domestic white goods, bathrooms and kitchens manufacturer. 27% of the marketplace in Spain, where most of the profit margins were, but all over the world. All over the world they had to compete against, it's a very mature industry. So all over the world they had to compete against um, you know, low cost labor. So their margins were zero. So they made their profit in Spain. Well. In 2008, before the Great Recession, um, construction was 10% of the Spanish GMP, and construction tourism was another 10%. Show me a country that depends on tourism, and I'll show you a poor country. 10% of that construction GMP disappeared in 2008. Everybody went bankrupt. 
and there was no, no more need in Spain for new kitchens and new bathrooms. So Wondergon, you know, it was the first cooperative. Everybody had a, an emotional uh, attachment. This is, this is not in the wind column here. This is a defect, a cultural defect. So they felt this incredible loyalty. And so for five years, they bailed it out. Over 500 million euros, but there's 240 entities in the group. And at some point, it, we were realizing that we were eating our seed corn for something that wasn't happening anymore. And when they, when they presented their last Sanimento um, economic cleaning up balance sheet for 167 million euros, uh, it, was a, it was a unanimous vote of no. And um, no one was, it was the proverbial deer in the headlights. Um, they weren't prepared to say no. We didn't know how to say no. And um, Mondragon, we have really no communications. We have, we have so much earned media that uh, we have one guy sitting behind a computer answering emails from all over the world. It's not, it's not a PR machine, it's not DC, right? So uh, everybody took a swipe at us. Uh, economists said, well, uh, cooperative Happy Valley is failing. Wall Street Journal uh, took us apart for even daring to think that we were an alternative to the economist, to the capitalist structure. But in reality, what happened is, is an interesting story because our redundant ecosystem, one worker, one vote principles actually kicked in and worked. So we had a good rainy day fund, but everybody voted to contribute 1.5% of their salary to beef up that fund by about 50 million euros. We there were 2,200 employees in the street. We kept all of them at 85% salary and benefits. We did not package up the equipment and, and, and ship it off to some overseas buyer. If you go on YouTube and look at this, I'm affiliated with the Steelworkers Union. If you, if you go and look at Steelworkers videos, you know, We've lost 60,000 factories since NAFTA was signed in the United States. And every one of those factories has the same video. Um, the foreign company shows up, the workers dismantle the, the equipment, they pack it all in a crate, the new owners give, give a speech, everybody gets, gets a pink slip, the equipment goes overseas, uh, there's a giant excavation in the middle of the community where the factory once had, and there's and nothing. You lose a whole generation of talented people. Or like the Miquiladoros in the early 90s, when the Asian economic miracle started happening and companies that were totally productive and proficient, it was like a field of locusts swept through them. One day they were going, next day they were gone. They had all the capability in the world, they had no ownership roots. They were wiped out by a systematic malaise. So Mondragon is totally different from that. Um, there's an expression in Mondragon that says, this is not paradise and we are not perfect. But in this, they're better than what happens everywhere else. What happened was within eight months, 1,500 of the 2,000 workers had been cross-trained and retrained into other cooperatives. Mm -hmm. 200 took early retirement. Um, I think there's 50 now that haven't found employment. 50 out of 20. The machinery stayed. It was sold to another multinational that came in. They decided that the convection arm was worthless, but the refrigeration arm was pretty good. That enterprise started up. They had 700 workers for a while. Now it's closed, they're trying something else. But the point of the fact is that if you keep your headquarters close, if you keep your means of production close, if you invest in local living economies, if, you have, if, you, if the people have the power to live to fight another day, there's always another day. When you don't have power built into the structure, then they become uh, creatively destroyed and there is no creative reconstruction. So what we're doing in the United States, then I'll finish, you can ask me questions. Try to ask me really hard questions. See if you guys are better than those Harvard Business School students. <laughs> no pressure. That's okay. That's okay. No I, pressure. I can handle it. Um, um, so what we're doing in the United States is we have something called One Worker, One Vote. We started in Cincinnati. I would like to say that we started there because we knew what was gonna happen in 2016, but that would be a lie. We started in Cincinnati because we had brilliant, intelligent people there that started it, and we filled in after the 2016 election, and it looks like incredible hindsight and foresight, but it was serendipity all the way. Um, our, our national prototyping lab is in Cincinnati. We have the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative. We have the Dayton Union Cooperative Initiative. We have the LA Union Cooperative Initiative. We're forming the New York City Cooperative Initiative with Central Brooklyn and the South Bronx. Um, Harvard Business School did a case study. Harvard Business Review published us in August. 
Um, we're now uh, working uh, with my colleague in Mondragon, good friend of Jerome's, um, and also Philippe's, uh, Ivan Zagasti, who if he was here would do a much better job than I'm doing. Um, we're working with, the, with Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party and the Preston model, which is built on Mondragon principles, uh, where they're turning around again, Northwest England. Um, and we're being uh, visited by parliamentarians from more countries than I can count because they all want to put unions and co-ops together. The biggest things they have in their country on the side of progressive anything are unions and co-ops. Again, one brings solidarity and the other one brings economic democracy. And by putting them together, you get two plus two equals something much bigger than four. Um, and we're trying to prove that here in the United States. Um, we're in the trenches. When people ask me what my job is, I say, I'm in the tire creation business. And they say, what do you mean by that? They say, we have to create tires so that other people can kick them. <laughs> so with that, um, you know, give me your best questions as we close out the day. Yes, ma'am.